Decisions are on the way in the city council chambers. How much money will be approved in the delayed community benefits agreement? And how much will go where it was originally intended? Mayor Donna Deegan joins us on that topic and others concerning the River City. Then innovation meets the elevation of Jacksonville as a manufacturer. Jacksonville has a certain, certain history with all the activities, as I said, started by JTA about autonomous mobility. An announcement that makes history with a German company landing on Jacksonville as the place to build a factory for autonomous vehicles. That's a big win for JTA. These shuttles will be perfect for deploying in less dense areas where a 40-foot bus is overkill. Half a million square feet on the way with hundreds of jobs connected. Those topics and more on This Week in Jacksonville. So glad you're with us today. So September is here and also here we welcome back Jacksonville Mayor Donna Deegan. So good to see you. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, I appreciate it. So as we uh, are in September, that means October 1st is coming soon and that's when the new fiscal year begins. What's left to do before this new budget takes effect? Well, there's still some really significant things we need to address um, <clears throat> from my perspective anyway. Um, I, I think that we need to make sure that that um, there's a few things we would like to make sure get back into the budget. Uh, that have been that, that have been you know either taken out or or or, or set aside for the moment. And one of those things is, is the homelessness initiative. You know, we have that new federal law, or sorry, new state law that we have to comply with as of October 1st. I think, I think it becomes punitive for us as of January 1st. Um, but but we, um, we have a 12 point plan for that. The cost of that plan is a little over $13 million. We had $10 million in the budget for it. Council took out 9 million of that. Um, but it's, it's all sorts of things from outreach teams to data collection to more beds to wraparound services. It, 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 is, it is the difference between just sweeping people off the streets and just having them come back a couple of weeks later and actually trying to solve the problem. I think that's where the, the two visions are sort of not married right now. And so we're, what, we're, what we're trying to do with council is to bring them along on this um, which they have been informed as we've gone along. But, but it's incredibly important that we um, put some of that money back into the budget. We're hoping to get that $10 million back and, and to raise another $3 million from the private sector okay. um, to try that, to solve this problem. And that's certainly one of my questions on this topic specifically was, hey, the, the money that's been set aside, is this enough? How will this, uh, you know, really take shape? And I know that uh, there are a couple of bills in city council regarding this, and one is giving JFRD money to create a homeless person EMS response yeah. team. No, it's wonderful. JFRD, JFRD is really, if you think about it, they're the folks that are on the front lines of, of, of a lot of interaction with people people that are in distress yeah. and, and they, they, they have they've stepped up and really are excited about partnering on this issue uh, so so they will be our partner in this there will be a whole team that is dedicated just to that outreach piece um, that we're, we're trying to, to make sure that we can get people not only off the streets but then the services they need to make sure that they can ultimately become productive citizens because you're not going to solve a problem by simply sweeping people off the streets and then and then hoping they don't that's just not a that's not a way to deal with the problem. So so it's this is not for me about disappearing people. This is about trying to help people become productive members of our city and and to solve a problem that is frankly very very frustrating for a lot of our citizens. Yeah, how did you feel about this? Um, essentially, I think you described in a news release an unfunded mandate coming our way from the state uh, when it comes to homelessness. It's something that the city of Jacksonville already is saying. Hey, we need to make some adjustments and do better. Well, that well that's the thing. You know, I think there's a couple million dollars in the budget for it right now, but that that's not going to 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 solve for all the things that are in that legislation. They're saying you need to provide a place for these people to be. You need to provide the wraparound services. All those things cost money. And so we need to make sure that we're solving this problem once and for all, and that frankly, we comply with, with the state law so that, so that we're not sued or, or get in, in trouble in terms of, of not complying with that. So it is unfunded at the moment, so it's up to cities to fund it. And the problem goes beyond downtown. I've heard, well, why don't we just address downtown? That's not what the legislation says. You know, we have 850 square yeah. miles here in the city and we've, we've got downtown. to address the yeah. situation in the entirety of the city. Plus, you don't want to just displace people from one area to have them go to another area. So it, it's really about solving the problem. And I think, you know, once we really have an opportunity to get more into it, explaining that the pieces of that, um, hopefully 
we'll have our experts come that, have, that we worked so long and so hard with um, in, in this community that, that work on these issues and explain why this money is so desperately needed if we want to solve this problem. And yeah. we do. And, and uh, just to be clear about it, so this is Florida House Bill 1365. Yeah, it takes, it's the new state law, takes effect October 1st, makes it illegal to sleep in public places. Right. Uh, and then I saw the the other thing in the bill in council there was uh, it makes it unlawful to use the bathroom in any place that's open to public, like streets, sidewalks, alleyways, whatever. And that's one of those elements that I don't think people necessarily, they would say, oh, yes, we, we don't want that. But again, it comes down to are we making this a criminal act or criminalizing? Well, but again, if we're, if we're going to take all these options away, we need to make sure that we are providing a way for people to have a pathway back yeah. to a productive life. That's really everything from mental health services to a place to, to, to live uh, in the meantime while we're getting them connected to these services to outreach teams that they can trust that will help connect them to these services. The, these are, these are, this is a program, this 12-step plan has really been something that we have spent a long time with the people in this community that, that, are, that are experts on these issues that have said these are the things we need to solve the problem. So I think we want to all solve the problem. There, but there's no easy solution. It's something that cities everywhere have been dealing with for Unfor a long time. Un unfortunately, all things are possible with money, uh, Kent, <laughs> you know, but, but there are some things that we, that we must we must address, and this is one of those things for the safety of our community, uh, for, for the, the, the economic viability of our community, for, for, the, for the health of our community. We need to deal with this. So let, let me ask about this. Uh, I know that it was a big victory for your administration, for the city, uh, when city leaders agreed with the Jaguars on uh, a renovated stadium and a new lease. That was back in June, $1.4 billion agreement there. But Mayor, many people pointed to the community benefits agreement as, hey, this is really beyond a stadium. This is really a, a great investment and really important. A lot of that money got uh, kind of postponed, decisions to be made during the summer. How do you feel, I, I, as I understand it, I think there's a vote is coming up in city council on Tuesday That's night right. about this. That's right. How do you feel about how that process is going, where that money is going to be deployed now? Well, look, it's, it's all a process. And that's always what, you know, the, the, the budget process is always interesting. But at the end of the day, I think the, the money has largely been approved. So the, the, the question now is how do we deploy that money? And so the idea behind the community benefit agreement, and by the way, the Jaguars are very much in lockstep with the way that we view this. Um, their money comes in over time, over 30 years. Our money, the idea behind our money on the city side was let's provide a big seed, a big investment up front so that their money can sort of water that seed as the years go along and keep it growing, right? Um, but, but what we've seen is we've seen efforts to stretch that way out. I think the latest proposal I saw said 33 years um, would be, not that, the, not that it would be the, the idea that we would wait 33 years, but that we would have up to 33 years to get it done. I don't think we want that sort of a, of a time period involved in this. It's a um, real slow trickle. Is it's what a it slow trickle. Like. It doesn't sound like so much of a yeah. scene. But, but I will say with the east side money, with the money for the east side, I believe that was reduced to seven years or, or increased to seven years, not 33. It's that, it's that um, affordable housing piece, the workforce development, the other citywide pieces that, that at the moment we're debating what those years should look like. So we're still talking to council about that. Hopefully we'll have some some um, uh, amended um, proposals there and, and we'll get to a place where we all feel good about. And Mayor, I want to dive a little deeper on that, but we're going to take a quick commercial. So our conversation with Mayor Donna Deegan will continue as we delve deeper into the city's budget decisions and more. That's next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. Jacksonville Mayor Donna Deegan, our guest this morning. We've been talking about uh, the Community Benefits Agreement, this special committee on the Community Benefits Agreement that was going through City Council. They voted to recommend that the city fully fund the $94 million portion of the CBA that was under review by the committee. $40 million of that for countywide homelessness, affordable housing, workforce development. You felt like this was critical to that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think all of those issues are important. In fact, we have we actually have an affordable housing um, bill that that is moving through council. It's another portion of the actual budget um, that that has been um, deferred. Uh, that that would in, in involve a ten million dollar loan from the city. Um, it's a partnership with the community foundation and with the the Jesse Ball Dupont Fund um, that would allow us to ultimately reap 
over $120 million back to the city for affordable housing units. And that's huge. Um, it's a program that's happened in North Carolina very successfully. Um, we've been looking at it for a long time. I think, uh, I think that the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund has, has been promoting this for a while and they, they, they brought it to us and we said, this is brilliant. We're 35,000 units down at the moment. We need to make sure that we're dealing with that. Um, and, uh, and, and at the moment, that money is not in the budget either. So, so we're hoping to get that back into the budget too, in addition to all the elements yeah. of, the, of the CBA. You referenced it uh, last segment we were talking about it, but when you have uh, some private-public partnership, I mean, the, the private entities are coming in, in this case, a nonprofit like the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund, that can make a big difference. Well, we've already raised almost $20 million there on the, on the matching side. That's the thing. You know, so so we, we would lose all that. We would lose the ability to, to get to, to get ultimately to 120 million dollars in that fund. And I think the question is, you know, will we have that 10 million dollars paid back to us? I think there's about a one percent chance, according to the Jesse Ball Dupont Fund, that we would that we would not get that back. So that's a pretty good that's a pretty good you know pretty good odds there. Um, but we feel really good about it, and we hope to get it back in because we certainly need more affordable housing units in Jacksonville. Let me ask about this: a finance committee that was overseeing your budget proposal there voted to defund the chief of diversity and inclusion position currently held by Dr. Parvez Ahmed. Um, what do you do with that? The city council member Rory Diamond, we talked to him about this, but basically said this is not needed. Almost saying waste of money. Nobody wants this. How do you feel about well, that? Well, I certainly wouldn't say nobody wants it, but what I would say is that I, I think that where you run into roadblocks there, a lot of times it's with language. I think you hear that those letters DEI, and, and it, it makes some people think a thing that there's not ex what we're doing with this program. But beyond that, at the end of the day, we know that to get certain grants that we want, you have to have diversity pieces in that. We know that, that, that bus to business in our business community, incredibly important to have diversity and inclusion. So, so these are important issues for our city. We want everybody to feel welcome. That's really what it's all about. To, to, it's, it's outreach to our mosaic of, of, of our folks in Jacksonville. But we've been thinking for, for several months of, of a, an evolution in that position that would include more data analytics in terms of transparency and, and, and efficiency in government. Um, so so what, we, what we would like to do is, is sort of evolve that position. Um, and, and create, certainly we want outreach to the community, but we also want this data analytics piece, which would, which would actually play into Dr. Ahmed's strengths in terms of, of what he does, uh, has done for many, many years. So, you, so that's something we- You still want him part of what I your really, administration is and, doing. And I, think, and I think you talk to the people on the council, to a person, and they'll say he's incredibly valuable. I think the problem really comes in terms of that language. And, 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 and when people look at what we've done, I don't think anybody would argue with what he's done in that, in that position. But so I just think we, my hope is we can get to a place um, where we're, we're still doing those things that we really want and need to do to make everyone feel included in this city and provide some, some, some really good uh, data that would help us uh, really move forward as a city as well. Mayor, final minute in our segment and our time here together, but uh, the, the health care issue is very big for you, obviously uh, a passion for you. And we've got a situation here uh, with Florida Blue uh, as an insurer and Baptist uh, Health. Is this something that, that the city's going to get involved in? Uh, you said it's affecting a lot of people. Well, sure. I mean, look, w affordable health care is incredibly important in our city. And you've got two of our largest employers, Florida Blue and Baptist Hospital, that are at odds right now. You know, we're looking at, at something that could have an impact and already, frankly, is having an impact on thousands of our citizens. Uh, so as you know, Darnell Smith has been my chief of staff since January, also a, a, an incredibly valuable asset to Florida Blue. He's going to be splitting time between his, his, uh, his work uh, at the city and with Florida Blue to try to get this resolved. If it's not resolved by, by by the 24th when we get finished with with the budget he'll probably go back there full time at that point because this has to get resolved it's something that's just not good for the city right now we've, we've got to get that that thing done um, we've got a lot of folks waiting on surgeries and things that, that are that feel like they're up in the air um, so so these are important issues at the moment but um, I want to make very very clear that Darnell has has continue to have that firewall up between any anything that's happened between the city and Florida Blue. Darnell has not been involved in, but this is something that he can use those those skills that he has and, and, and has known for so long um, to make sure that he can help in this issue between between Florida Blue and Baptist. And I'm hoping for the sake of our entire city that they can get that done. Mayor Donna Deegan, I appreciate the time and uh, we will look forward to pestering you again maybe next month. Please do. Okay. Enjoy it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much.
All right, well, stay with us. Autonomous vehicles, they're in the area already, and now a history-making announcement about manufacturing. JTA leader Nat Ford joins me next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. All right, Jacksonville taking another step toward, uh, toward becoming a major player in the world of self-driving vehicles. Uh, months of uh, code names and massive tax break approvals. JTA announcing the plan for a new facility to produce autonomous electric vehicles as part of Project Link. That just happened this Wednesday. Joining us right now, JTA's Chief Executive Officer, Nathaniel Ford. Nat Ford, JTA announcing this. This is, it, when you walked in today, you're like, I'm excited. Yeah. I could tell because uh, this is the culmination of years right. of trying to put uh, Jacksonville in this position, right? Exactly, and we are just uh, excited. Uh, this was a historic moment, not just for the JTA, but clearly for Jacksonville, for Florida, and for our nation, uh, for Holon to come to Jacksonville, Florida, and mass produce autonomous vehicles for public transportation. So, uh, hold on, a German company, and they yes. said, we're going to Florida. How did that happen? Well, it was years of work. Uh, <laughs> you know, we found, you know, as part of our project, Buy America is one of the requirements, and we support Buy America. Uh, however, there were no uh, purpose-built Buy America compliant vehicles being uh, produced in the United States. Well, uh, that put us on a hunt. Uh, we knew that this technology and this work was happening over in Europe, uh, and uh, we sought out uh, some of the companies that were working in this space. They knew about our U2C project as one of the premier projects in the United States, and uh, it was just really talking about the, I can't, the benefits of Jacksonville, our workforce, the people we have here, our community, and uh, I'm glad it came to fruition. So, and as this was announced this week, so we're seeing uh, the facility is going to be like 450,000 square feet. Yes. First in Florida, as you were talking about. Massive. E expected to employ up to like 200 people, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a capital investment of $100 million. So this, this is going to make a difference in our region. Definitely, uh, and for generations to come. You know, uh, think about the number of vehicles that they are producing or planning to produce for the rest of the United States and then using our port to export vehicles back to uh, Europe. And you, you think about the jobs that are going to be created and also the businesses that are also going to be supporting them in terms of parts and, and uh, uh, activities to support their operations. So we're, it's just massive. It's not just the JTA and the U2C project. It might have been a catalyst. But at the end of it, uh, it's the, the work climate, the employees here that they can find. I, I'm going to pester you vehicles. to uh, join me on our podcast where we maybe, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, we, we dive into this. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me shift a little bit here, mm -hmm. though. Uh, there's a self-driving shuttle in Brooklyn right now. And this yes. is kind of a, a test project. What's the update yes. on that? Yes, and so one of the things that uh, we find uh, with this type of technology is helping people understand the technology and get used yeah. to it. And so we are launched a number of different pilots, the Brooklyn Lunch uh, Time pilot. Uh, it was preceded by the FSCJ pilot. Mm -hmm. So the idea is as we're developing the Bay Street Innovation Corridor project, uh, very early, helping people get acclimated to these new transportation modes. Yeah, innovation can be uh, intimidating to yes. a, a lot of people. Exactly. And I'm sure some of the, I don't know if it's pushback, but some of the concerns you probably hear are, yes. I don't know if I want to ride in a vehicle that doesn't have a driver right there. Exactly, and with that in mind, you know, when we plan to launch in June of 2025, the Bay Street Innovation Quarter shuttle operation, we plan to have an attendant on the vehicle to help folks feel comfortable that this driverless vehicle and that this technology is safe. And until such time that you know, people get comfortable, we will continue <laughs> to have the attendants. All right, you just said something that, mm -hmm. that really rang my bell there. You said June 2025. That's less, that's like nine months from now. That's oh, yeah. less than a year uh -huh. after years of working on that's this and right. getting ready and getting approval and getting money and all of that, right? Yes, it, it's been a journey, but it's been a worthwhile journey in terms of what it brings to our community going into the future. Construction is underway now, and uh, the whole idea is if we can move people more efficiently in our community, we have done our jobs here at the JTA. 
So with JTA, I wanted to get to this. Uh, you recently did a community art project. Yes. Uh, so there are things beyond just transporting people uh, around our area that you guys exactly. are involved in. What's yeah, the definitely. Uh, you know, when we built the headquarters the, for the JTA in La Villa, one of the things we thought was very important as we do these infrastructure projects, why not add art and, uh, and be part of the culture community? People feel pride, a sense of pride in terms of having facilities that are clean, that are attractive. And uh, I think it's a good addition, that Northwest Corridor project that you're referencing, uh, to have local community artists develop their art and have it installed in the bus shelters in their community. Uh, we see them and we recognize their importance in terms of our operation. And right. the community. It, and that's what someone in the community wants. That's yes. what I think all of us want, right? Exactly. I want to be seen. Right. I want you to recognize me. We've got about 30 mm -hmm. seconds left. Mm -hmm. um, it's a real, it seems like a really exciting time for a JTA. Um, it, it, can you contain yourself in, in the next several months before some of these things roll out? It's very hard to. <laughs> I mean, we wake up every morning thinking of innovative ways we could provide more mobility in this community. And I just, I'm so proud of the JTA staff, our board of directors. They join me in waking up every morning. How can we move people to jobs, how we could get them to the doctor's office, and how we could get them to, get them to those educational opportunities. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to contain it, but... Uh, a great pursuit. Yeah. Nat Ford, JTA's CEO, and uh, the Energizer Bunny right over here. The, the enthusiasm <laughs> is just jumping right there. Thank you so much for your time. I well, thank it. you for having me, Ken. Yeah. And thank you for your time. I'm Kent Justice. Thanks for watching On Air Channel 4, CW17. Always online at newsforjax.com and streaming on News for Jax+. Plus. And don't forget to check out our podcast this week in Jacksonville Business Edition. This episode is looking at the incredible opportunity for technicians in the U.S. semiconductor industry. See why every day more people are choosing News for Jacks, Northeast Florida, and South Georgia's number one source for local news.